So welcome everybody. Welcome everybody. My name is Trevi Johnson. I'm the director and the founder of Radical Joy for Hard Times. And this is our monthly uh, Earth Exchange Cafe conversation, where we have conversations with interesting people, artists, thinkers, writers, philosophers, who are interacting with the world, the natural world in, a, in new and inspiring ways. And I'm totally excited today to introduce Carl Safina, who's an amazing writer. Uh, his nonfiction work explores animal intelligence and how humans are changing the natural world and how those activities affect all of us. His work fuses scientific understanding and emotional connection and close observation and a moral call to action. He's won a MacArthur Genius Prize, uh, as well as Pew, Guggenheim, and National Science Foundation Fellowships. He's won many uh, awards and medals for his work. And uh, Carl is now the, he's the first endowed professor for humanity and nature and humanity at Stony Brook University in New York. And he's the founding president of the not-for-profit Safina Center. Carl has hosted the PBS series, Saving the Ocean, which you can view for free at pbs.org, Saving the Ocean. And his writing has appeared in many top magazines and on websites like Huffington Post. He is the author of 10 books, including Song for the Blue Ocean and the New York Times bestseller, Beyond Words, what animals think and feel. We'll be talking a little bit about that during this conversation. And his most recent book is Becoming Wild, how animals, how animal cultures raise families, create beauty and achieve peace. And this is the wonderful cover of that book. Uh, he lives on Long Island, New York with his wife, Patricia and their dogs and their feathered friends. Carl, welcome to the Earth Exchange Cafe. Thanks so much. It's really nice to be with you. So as I, as I was mentioning to you when uh, we were talking before we actually started, you've spent so much time studying and getting to know uh, particular species of animals, African elephants, scarlet macaws, Yellowstone wolves. And what you're interested in is how animal intelligence works for the animals. You're not interested in learning about animal intelligence and mapping it onto human intelligence and trying to compare that. So can you elaborate a little bit on the differences in those two approaches and give us an example of how animal intelligence works for one of the groups of animals you've studied? Well, first of all, humans are animals. So animal intelligence includes us, but we, we have our own uh, kind of a brain and mind and and every other species you could say the same thing about uh, you know the mind of a wolf is different from the mind of an elephant which is different from the mind of a raven or a parrot um, I, I'm interested in knowing who we're here with I'm, I'm not um, so interested in comparing um, and I'm really not interested in learning about other animals just to answer a question about humans, for instance, you know, studying chimpanzees in order to understand how language evolved in humans. That, that to me does not even seem to be a good question. Um, and uh, what I'm really interested in is the animals I'm looking at. I, I want to know who I'm here with on this planet and how we are similar, how we're different. Um, you know, and there are uh, social animals have minds that tend to make them want to be near each other. I think we know how that feels. Uh, animals that um, that hunt uh, have minds that make them like to chase things. Um, but uh, almost almost all animals have much more complicated lives than that. They have a social life of some kind. Um, they have a foraging mode of some kind. Some of them build shelter. Some of them never are uh, under any shelter at all. So there's there's a huge range, and um, most people are are not very familiar with most animals. And uh, you know, maybe maybe you have a dog or a cat or something like that, but most other animals you never really get to watch. There are birds flying by. And very few people have the luxury of sitting. Uh, 
and watching them for hours on end day after day. But but I have had I've had those luxuries and that's been my interest and in my work for a very long time now. Yeah. So how did you um, what were you like as a child? I mean, did you have were you did you have that kind of a curiosity about animals as a child? Yeah, as a as a kid, I I was strangely drawn to animals. I don't really exactly know why. Um, my my father's hobby was raising canaries, but my sister and I grew up in the same place with the same parents, and uh, she has a, a, an interest in nature, but not uh, you know she's not a skilled birder or anything like that, and. Um, and I just got really, really drawn into it. And I just wanted more and more and still do. Well, in, um, in Becoming Wild, you, 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 you study three different animals. Um, you study sperm whales and scarlet macaws and chimpanzees. And, um, and, and the different sections are devoted to with the whales, it's uh, family and with the birds, it's beauty and with the chimpanzees, it's, uh, it's peace. So did you know when you set out to, to study those different animals that you were going to focus on each of those particular things? Or did that evolve out of being there and observing them? Well, that book is about culture. And I knew going in that I, you know, I had chosen those, those species because they are cultural and they're well enough studied. Well, with the exception of the star, scarlet macaws, which were not really considered to be cultural, but I had seen wild macaws do some things that very much intrigued me. So I wanted to go and investigate them a lot deeper. So what were uh, some of the things you that they did that intrigued you? Well, the main thing was um, you can watch a flock of birds of, of any species fly, fly by and usually they are evenly spaced. And in the macaws that I had seen year, years before I started working on the book about, you know, I actually was working on my previous book. I had seen macaws in the Peruvian Amazon and when they're in a flock, let's say it's a flock of 12, it's clearly six pairs of two. You can clearly see who is flying with who exactly. And these pairs are in a flock, but they're not, they're not in that flock just as random individuals. They're in the flock as pairs that have bonds with specific uh, mates of theirs, or possibly friends, not exactly sure in, in all those cases. Uh, but, so I thought, you know, there's a lot going on here apparently, and it's something that I've never seen in any other bird flock, even though I've made a living studying birds for quite a few years in the past. Um, so I wanted to go deeper into that, but the themes about family and, creating beauty and achieving peace. Those themes emerged from what I learned. I didn't have that going in. I only knew that there were three good candidates for learning about culture in, uh, in some other species. Yeah. Well, um, it, it's as radical joy for hard times is um, devoted to making beauty for hurt places. I myself was particularly interested in um, what you have to say about beauty as it relates to the macaws and other birds, you know, like the bowerbird making, making beautiful uh, places for its mate to come and, um, and be in. Um, but, and you have this quite, I think, quite extraordinary sentence in, the, in the, one of the chapters about the macaws. You say, Beautiful is a sense created in a mind. A sense of beautiful is an evolved capacity of minds. That's a very intriguing sentence. Um, can you describe or elaborate a little bit more on that, what you mean and how beauty works among those scarlet macaws that you were with? Well, that's a big question. And it may, may take a while to work through all of that. But that's basically, okay. beauty is not a quality that's in a thing. You know, um, a piece of wood is just a piece of wood or um, a feather even. You can describe the structure of a feather or what it's made of, but beauty is only an impression that we get about a piece of wood or about a feather. We might even say that one feather is more beautiful than another. That is not a property of the feather itself. That's 
our value judgment that our mind creates about it. And I think um, <clears throat> just to try to <clears throat> try to encapsulate one of the big things going on there is that if you see something like a feather or a bird that has feathers that are brightly colored, not camouflaged and utilitarian, but brightly colored, or um, they have plumes, um, crests, uh, long tails, things like that, that are not there to um, serve a utilitarian purpose of survival, the, the question becomes, why do they have those things? Why, why do some birds have, you know, incredibly long tails? Think about a peacock, let's say, or the plumes of an egret or um, very bright colors like macaws or painted buntings or things like that. Why? And the answer is that other birds chose them to be that way, that there is um, a sort of an arbitrary aesthetic and a preference for mates that strike them as looking a certain way because that look is perceived as beautiful by those potential mates that are choosing mates. Now, humans do this all the time, but like most of what we do, we're not really aware of what we're doing or why we're doing it. It's, it, it comes so naturally, we don't think of it at all. But um, we have a sense of aesthetics and, and we appear not to be alone in the world. Most of the beauty in the living world, it, um, you know, the, the sort of the extravagant beauty, um, the, the shapes and colors of flowers, um, birds, uh, other animals that have, you know, just what you might call ornaments um, on their bodies like um, antlers and things like that. The, these are the results of choices that have been going on for thousands of generations. Flowers are obviously made by plants, but the, the way that they look has been chosen by pollinators mm. as, you know, choosing the most attractive ones works for the plant. So the, the plant um, then makes more copies of those flowers that have worked for it. But, but what is working as colors brighten is the fact that they are being chosen um, on some aesthetic basis by the pollinators. Uh, same thing with the scents. You know, a, a plant smells as a way to signal to pollinators, but it, it smells beautiful because that is an aesthetic attraction. And it's odd, it's odd that humans are aesthetically attracted to the smell of flowers because we are not pollinators and none of our uh, None of our ancestors are pollinators. We don't come from a line of pollinators. And yet things like flowers and, and the scent of flowers, the look and the scent of flowers, which are not meant for us, appear to us as beautiful, which opens up, I think, another can of worms, which is why do things that are not meant for us appear to us as beautiful? Yeah, I hope you'll write about that someday. <laughs> it's a wonderful question. And you, you have in one of the macaws chapters in the book, you, you, you just, you mentioned the bowerbird, you know, which makes these extraordinary, and I actually saw one when I was in Australia visiting the philosopher Glenn Albrecht, a bowerbird building a, um, whatever you call it, a bower between, just underneath two hedges between, in a suburban lawn with all of these blue items. And, um, and then the book, you say something like scientists are tying themselves up in knots trying to figure out why the bowerbird does this. Well, maybe it's because it's beautiful. You know, it's, such, it's a kind of an obvious, it's kind of an obvious answer. Well, the, it may be an obvious answer, but it's also the only answer that makes any sense at all, because there are certain species of bowerbirds that prefer blue and some prefer red. 
if you move the things they put in certain places, they put them back where they put them. And the only thing that anybody has come up with that makes any sense is that they just like it that way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's just an aesthetic. There's a lot of aesthetics in the world. People have, uh, you know, people are always trying to flatter themselves by thinking that we're the only ones that do lots of things. We're the only ones that have aesthetics. We're the only ones that are capable of love, you know, all these things, but it's not true. We get it from someplace and we, we get it through our, our evolution and those things have long histories and wide histories. Yeah, and it would seem that like you like your example about the flowers, they're sometimes it's parallel histories, not necessarily one evolving from another. I mean, it makes me think of one of the stories you tell in the um, in your earlier book, um, Beyond Words, when you're you're studying uh, killer whales, and one of the people on the boat, uh, you're out in the ocean, and and his hat blows off of his head into the water, and a few minutes later, this whale come swimming toward the boat with the hat on its head. I mean, is that, is that, is that a sense of play? Is that a sense of humor? Is it a, is it a sense of, well, I, I, you know, now I've noticed the whale thinking, I've, I've noticed where hats go on, on a body and now I'm bringing yours back to you so you can put it on that part of your body. I mean, what do you make of that, that extraordinary incident? Uh, it seems to reflect a little of all of those things. And those whales are very, very social. They, they have uh, quite, quite a bit of empathy. They're extraordinarily intelligent. They, their brains are much bigger than our brains, although they're constructed differently. Anyway, um, I think that whale was just trying to help by retrieving the hat. That's, that's what I think was going on. Huh. Yeah. Clearly it was, but there's also something just very delightful about it. Sure. Well, life is delightful, or at least it should be. Indeed. Uh, so another thing um, in, you, in, the, in your chapter in um, Becoming Wild about the chimpanzees, well, your whole section about the chimpanzees, uh, you reach a point sort of like, I think it's maybe about a quarter of a third of the way through where you just kind of get annoyed with the male chimps and their their posturing and their 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 need to prove that they're the best and you know they run into a situation and everybody has to pay attention to them and you just kind of get fed up with it but then later on you end up calling that chapter it's about peace it's not about aggression so how did you get to that what was there a particular part of your time spending time with those chimpanzees in Uganda where that started to switch for you and what was it? Well, the, the thing is that the, um, all, all of the drama really gets your attention. And we had spent a lot of time with males in one of the chimp communities. Males are the ones who, who um, really create most of that drama and most of the ego driven stuff, the calling attention to themselves, trying to test their dominance and all of that kind of stuff, which, you know, is another thing that unfortunately we recognize too much in our, in our human selves. But like humans, the, the chimps are actually peaceful 99% of the time. And if you hang around with mostly females, which we did when we moved to a, a, a different uh, adjacent chimp community and spent time there, we, we were with other researchers doing, looking at other aspects of their lives and we were with mostly females. And um, they were just a lot more peaceful, a lot more mellow, um, a lot less drama, a lot less of that male aggression nonsense. And um, the, the thing is though, and, and why I wrote about it from the perspective of achieving peace is that any animals that live together um, the, the, the togetherness causes inevitable friction. But these groups don't break apart. They usually stay together for, um, uh, in many cases, for hundreds of years through many generations, a certain community will, will stay intact. So if there's all this drama and if there's fighting, you know, why not just leave? 
what keeps them together. There are benefits to being together. There is safety in numbers. There, there are some other benefits to being together. And so in the face of the inevitable friction that living together causes, they also need to have skills for creating peace out of that friction and getting, getting past it, soothing things over and, um, and moving beyond. So that's, that's what I was talking about there, how, how they do that. So can you give a particular, tell a particular story about how something like that happened that you witnessed? Well, one thing that sometimes happens is uh, two males will have a fight and um, a female might be friends with one or both of those males and she may start grooming one of them and another one will come a little closer and, you know, really like not wanting to lose face or make it seem obvious, then she'll start to groom the other one and then they'll all move a little closer. And then after a while, they'll, the ones that were fighting will start grooming the female, both of those males. And then they may start grooming each other or they may not start grooming each other, but the female will, will sometimes just at that point get up and walk away, leaving those two males sitting there in a grooming mood. And then they'll, they'll start grooming each other and then that will be the end of their tension. And that, that's, that's a skill set, you know, that chimpanzees have, have an, I would say an impulse to do, but they also have very, they very much have to learn how to do those things. They learn that by a lifetime of watching. That's why their, their childhood extends to uh, about 10 or 12 years, that, because like us, they have a lot to learn. And uh, they absorb all these, uh, all these aspects of etiquette and, um, you know, just, just the way things are done culturally. Um, and not all communities or not all chimpanzee populations are the same. The, the ones in East Africa tend to be, uh, they tend to have the males that create the most trouble and the ones in West Africa have males that are um, a, a lot more mellow about things a lot more of the time. But, they are, but they're all the same species and the difference is a, a culture that they learn growing up as they model the behavior of males in those cultures. And that perpetuates through generations. Yeah, and of course, culture is, culture is the thread that weaves through you know, your entire book. That, you're, that how, that culture is, that the culture of one um, group of animals is not, is not necessarily the same of another group, group of animals, even though they might live in the same kind of habitat yeah. and they're the same species. And um, so can you give an example of, of, of two cultures that live in proximity to one another? But well, you just spoke about the chimpanzees, but I'm thinking about the, you gave an example of the, um, the sperm whales and how they learn to eat different things. Yeah, they hunt differently. They travel at different paces. They, um, one clan may travel in a, tend to travel in straight lines. The other may travel much more meanderingly. They, um, they may tend to be um, closer to the coast or farther from the coast than another clan. And these, these are all, um, they're just all learned um, habits, I guess you could call them. It's, it's a lot like the separation of, um, of labor in human communities where some learn to, you know, some learn to be teachers and some learn to be truck drivers. And that's, that's what they learn to be. And they have their separate cultures and they teach other individuals to do things the way they've learned to make a living. And, um, you know, and with humans, it's, it's, it's very complex, but the same basic principles are there in quite a few other animals like the, the sperm whales we were just talking about, all the animals that I wrote about um, in that book and, and the human animals as well. But as I said, with humans, 
Um, you can see it all if you think about it a little bit, but it's, it's complicated because we have cultures within cultures. But the reason that we don't all have one culture worldwide is that culture answers the question of how do we live here? And that varies from place to place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, the the sperm whales that you write about, you know, depending on their on how close they uh, they tend to stay towards a particular shore, it influences the kinds of things that they prefer to eat. But they're the same species. Yeah, yeah. So you know, a a, a baby that happened to be switched, which wouldn't really happen, but I mean, in, in another animal where uh, where that might happen, um, they could learn to do things the way a different culture does it, just like a human baby learns a culture totally arbitrarily as a result of where they happen to be born, what culture they happen to be born into. Yeah, so uh, on your, um, when you were studying the, the whales and your guide on that, Shane um, Garrow, uh, he mentions at one point that the, what he's learned from the whales, he's, le he's learned more about valuing his own family. And um, I wondered, um, what have you learned? I mean, what, has there been an important lesson that you've learned from the animals that you studied, not just in this book, but in others that, that has guided and shaped your life in that particular kind of way? Uh, well, I guess maybe it's that we are who we are because of the relationships we have. We're, we're made individuals, not individually. We're made individuals through our relationships. And we are who we are because of who we are with. I, I think that may be, uh, you know, well, at any rate, that's one of the big take homes for me. Let's, let me put it that way. Okay. Uh, so um, is there a place, what's your favorite place on earth? I mean, where do you feel, where do you find beauty and community most fully? Well, I guess home. I mean, that's where you find um, community most fully, but um, there are a number of places that I really love to be. I, I love Southeast Alaska a lot. And not, not only is it a, a place of spectacular beauty, but it has all the species that are supposed to be there. And it has humans at a very high level of technological achievement, but it does not have too many humans. So the whole place works. It, it continues to work as it's supposed to work for all the species that are supposed to be there. And yet, you know, it's possible to be in a, in a nice boat, listening to music, sending photographs to your friends. You can do all of that stuff, but um, we haven't overwhelmed and ruined the place by sheer numbers as we have in a lot of the rest of the world and as we're, you know, as we are doing. Yeah, and that's another question, something that I wanted to talk to you about is that, is that throughout your work, you are very conscious of all of the things that are endangering the world, endangering these animals, you know, habitat loss, hunting, climate change. Um, so there is, uh, there is fascination and there's um, beauty and um, in, in what you're describing, but there's also sadness because the fate of these animals is not um, good. The future is not promising for, for so many of them. So how do you yourself deal with that? I mean, how do you, how, how aware of it are you when you're studying and how do you live with it? Well, I'm aware of it all the time and I, I don't think it's just about them. It's not an us them thing. We, we, we are animals and what we are doing um, among other things, it, it robs the world of life and of beauty um, in the pursuit of our three headless horsemen, as I call them, which is bigger, faster, more. That, that's, that's all we seem to be aiming at. We don't know why. Um, we have no standards for how. It's just bigger, faster, more at the expense of everything, including human dignity in many places. Um, it's, uh, you know, it is heartbreaking a lot of the time. 
how do I cope with it? Well, there's a, there is a lot of remaining beauty. There's a lot to work for. There's there's a lot to work on the behalf of the the voiceless uh, among the non-humans, the the voiceless and the disempowered among the humans. Um, those things I think can continue to make our work and our life and our concerns worthwhile because um, compassion is always the right thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I get out as much as I can and try to immerse in the, the beauty that we have around where I live, Long Island, New York, um, or where we travel to. And to uh, also be inspired by the fact that a, a lot of the abundance that we have here now in the living world is recovered abundance from much worse times. We have more whales now than we did. There was a period of time when I was young, people thought that whales would be very likely um, to go extinct or many whales would be very likely to be driven extinct by the um, incredibly savage hunting that went on for many decades. And a uh, few people stopped that and turned it around. The same thing with some of the birds of prey that we have, peregrine falcons, bald eagles, ospreys, all of these things were essentially non-existent when I was a teenager because DDT and other hard pesticides had, um, had killed uh, almost all of them, almost everywhere. And a few people worked very hard to protect the remnants and bring them back. So we benefit greatly from the foresight, the effort and the persistence of people of the last generation. And that is a reminder that we are the generation now that um, the rest of the world is counting on. So. So tell us about your place, Long Island. Um, you live on the Long Island shore. You're teaching there. Um, tell us what's unique and remarkable about your place and why you love it. Well, I'll tell you the bad stuff first. It's Okay. Mostly tremendously overdeveloped. Um, there are far too many people here, um, and most of the uh, most of the space is, is totally overwhelmed by tract housing, suburban development, and sprawl. That's the bad news. The, the good news is there's really a lot left in the natural world, and there are some very fine people here and with a great tradition. Actually, one of the people that um, retired not long ago from my department at Stony Brook University, was one of the first people to work on the problem of DDT in the, um, in the, in the birds that I mentioned. And his work is largely the reason why we have those birds around us now, instead of, instead of them disappearing and going extinct, which would have happened. So we have some, some great personal history of some other great environmental leaders um, who, who started their work on Long Island. We are in the middle of a bird migration flyway on the Atlantic coast. Uh, we also are in a place where we, we have migrating whales, migrating fish, migrating turtles. We have lots and lots of different things that live here. And we have the ocean, we have a very complicated bay system where um, we have very shallow bays, very extensive shallow bay systems, very deep bay systems. Long Island is a, is a very unusually large island with this very deep sound between us and Connecticut and the Atlantic Ocean uh, out on the other side. So there's really, really a lot here. And there's a lot of that that I, uh, have always woven into my life and I continue to very much enjoy, which is why I'm still here. Yeah. Um, I want to read, um, there, was a, there was a passage in um, Becoming Wild that I thought was really beautiful and I uh, want to read it and get your um, thoughts on it. Um, you, you've been watching the sperm whales and you write this, for a little while, I am where I am best, among living manifestations of greater powers that long preceded me and may long outlast us all. For the duration of the encounter, the beauties and truths of them overwhelm the heartache, cleanse everything. 
For a short interval of time, they have tapped me awake and I feel at home in the world. It's so beautifully expressed. And, um, you know, the, because our goal with Radical Joy for Hard Times is to really make places, to, to really reconnect people with places that they love. Um, as you just described Long Island, not only in how they're still beautiful, but in how they're hurting and they're, how they're not so beautiful. So um, could, could this immersion in the moment and in the beauty help us survive the sorrows of what's happening to the natural world? Well, I mean, I think we need to just keep at it. And um, it's not enough to just survive the sorrows. We're, we're supposed to um, end the sorrow and uh, heal the world. That's what, that's what we need to do. Not just figure out a way to survive. You can survive the sorrows by turning on the television and, um, and making your mind go away. But I, I think what we need to do is find ways to heal the world and by keeping connected with the beauty that exists, continue to draw the strength and the joy and the inspiration and the, and the vision of what the, what, the, um, what the improved future should look like and, and the improving future should look like so that we, um, you know, we find great value in how we spend our time and, um, and sufficient happiness in being alive in this uh, truly unbelievable and miraculous planet that we're on. So what are some ways of healing the world? Oh, and any, any mission-driven thing that people are doing for other people, for landscapes, for other animals and other, other species, um, uh, all the environmental work. Uh, really, I mean, basically, it's all the environmental work and all the social work. And there are, um, well, I, what I know best is environmental work. There are dozens of, of um, sub-disciplines and different approaches. You know, it can be anything from a beach cleanup to um, buying thousands of acres of land uh, in some other continent and rewilding it. It depends a lot on what context you're working in, your, your personal history, what you're able to do. Um, you know, I, I just came back from a gathering of some really leading uh, environmental professionals and the differences in approach and the difference in scale were pretty impressive. Well, I think, I think that's very interesting because, you know, every, we, it, it's pretty much generally agreed that climate change is not going to be reversed. We can't, we can't heal that. But the way, if I understand correctly what you're saying, that any mission-driven approach towards doing something positive is a, is a form of healing. Yes, well, of course. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot about climate change that needs to be fixed. There's a lot that we're doing right now that needs to be stopped, reversed, replaced. Will we be the direct beneficiaries of that? Um, depends what you mean by direct. I think that doing something that is the right thing to do is, um, you know, that's uh, gratification enough. Yes, agreed. So um, what are you working on now, Carl? What's your new book gonna be about? I'm, I'm working on a book that um, braids a story of uh, a pair of owls in our backyard. This is COVID related because uh, I couldn't go anywhere at all last year. And uh, it coincided with the fact that a pair of owls decided to nest in our backyard. And so I was able to watch them for four or five hours a day. And uh, I'm, I'm braiding um, that story and how humans have decided to value the world in, in different parts of the world over the last few thousand years. So. Mm -hmm what has emerged to me is that there are basically four big different approaches to 
seeing uh, the human perspective of where we, where we are in the world and what our relationship with the world should be. There's indigenous views about that that have a lot of similarities all over the world. There's um, all of the South Asian philosophies and religions, the East Asian philosophies and religions, and Western philosophy and Western religions. And the, the West is a real outlier from all of the other thought uh, that uh, has occurred to people around the world, e even as different as it's been. The, the, West, the West really stands out. And um, I've learned a lot about that. And I understand uh, why things are the way they are in the world a lot better than I did a year ago. So that's what the book is about. That sounds amazing. Do, do you have a title for it yet? Not yet. I have oh. about eight. I have about eight or ten titles. None of them oh. are good enough yet. Okay. Well, I'm eager to read it. And um, and again, I just um, I so recommend Carl's books. And as I, um, uh, they're they're just incredibly deep and and thoughtful. Uh, and really outstanding writing as well, I must say, Thank you. engaging writing. So um, I very much recommend them. And um, typically with uh, the Earth Exchange Cafe, we have time for questions um, from listeners and watchers, but um, my colleague uh, Harriet is not here today and um, I just couldn't be a, a conversationalist and a techie at the same time. So. Um, Hopefully you will all be able to watch this and, um, and read the books and maybe your questions will be answered there. So Carl Safina, thank you so much for joining us on the Earth Exchange Cafe. And um, thank you so much for your, your wonderful work in the world. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you having me. It's been really fun to be with you. Good, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.